Father Gary Thomas is a pastor of a Roman Catholic church in Northern California in Saratoga. And when he was on sabbatical, started studying under an exorcist in Italy. And it later became the story guidelines of the book, The Right. And when talking to him today on the way here, he said that in the book, it's 100% accurate of what he encountered. It was later made into a movie, and the movie is um, somewhat Hollywoodized, but nothing that he wouldn't somewhat could encounter during exorcisms. Without further ado, I'd love to introduce Father Gary Thomas. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight, and I'm so grateful that so many of you are here. Before we begin with uh, my presentation and then the Q&A, um, why don't let us begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. All powerful God, we give you thanks and praise for bringing us here this night. And we ask your blessing, please, upon this talk and the information that will be presented, the truth, of the cross of our Lord Jesus and Satan's defeat. Lord, we just ask your blessing upon this assembly. And may everyone walk out of here tonight with a sense of hope and that any anxieties or fears may be dispelled. Bless the work of John the 23rd Parish, of the focused missionaries and all who are involved, not only in tonight's program, but in the ministry here in Fort Collins. And we ask this in prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I want to begin by saying this is a very galvanizing topic. Everybody has a reaction to the word exorcism or demon or Satan. And very few people really know very much about it. And I was one of those folks until I became the exorcist for the Diocese of San Jose. I've been a priest for 32 plus years. I have served as exorcist for 10. Um, how I became exorcist had to be providential because I don't think it was by accident. The, um, when the bishop decided to appoint an exorcist in 2005, it was um, because of a letter, a mandate that had come from St. John Paul II in 2004, directed to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which at that time was headed by Cardinal Ratzinger, mandating every bishop in the world to train, to select a priest and train them to be an exorcist. And so in 05, our bishop began, was getting requests from a variety of people to investigate um, certain kinds of alleged preternatural behavior and activity. And so he approached my closest priest friend, who is in my priest support group. And at our monthly meetings, we have prayer, adoration, scripture sharing, and then we have a view, the review of life. And in the review of life, you bring, in, you bring in an event or an experience from the previous month, and you discuss it in terms of how God may have been part of it or not part of it, but how it's affecting your life as a priest and as a Catholic. So this priest, Kevin, brings this information and says he's been at, and he was perfect candidate, doctorate in spirituality from Catholic U, had, knows lots and lots about the mystics. We thought he would be the perfect candidate. So a month later, he comes back and he says, I've decided I can't do this. I haven't got time to do that and be the head of the, the, school, the school of spirituality at the same time. And so I just serendipitously spoke up and said, I could do that. I could be the exorcist. I believe in the personification of evil. I didn't know what I was saying yes to. But there was something that was compelling me to say yes. And so I was getting ready to go on sabbatical to Rome. And I was already in a program, but it wasn't about exorcism. So I took a course in Rome, which is what the book, The Rite, is based on. And then I worked under an exorcist for three and a half months, Carmen de Fipolis, whose book, his name is in the book as well. And I observed about 80 exorcisms in that. In a sense, that and the course that was taught at the Regina Apostolorum, in a sense, was kind of the basis for when I 
returned and I had to come home two months early because of an emergency in the new parish that I had been assigned to because the last one I had fulfilled 12 years and was moving on. And the second day I arrived, the bishop sent the first case to me. And so the secretary, none of these people knew anything about this. And because I was going to a parish that was in a crisis, I didn't think it was uh, wise to say to them, oh, by the way, your new pastor is also an appointed exorcist. <laughs> and um, so the secretary come knocking on my door because I was in meeting with one of my first staff persons and said, uh, there's someone here for an exorcism? So I thought, I can't believe this is already happening. I want to start off the cross is the central most important symbol of our faith and it reminds us that though we have been saved we still need God in our lives in order for us to really understand the notion the reality the teaching of the church, and our stance with regards to this figure whom we refer to as Satan, we have to understand, well, where does Satan, personified evil, because that's what we're talking about, where does that fall in the whole economy of our salvation story? And so you have to start, the starting point is the cross. When we began prayer well, a few moments ago, we began with the sign of the cross. That's in our Catholic tradition. And our church is very rich in symbols. But the symbols are meant to express realities. They just don't stand for something in a static way. The cross, like all of our symbols, they stand for, for a truth in a dynamic way. And so Christ saved us once, but the reality is for all time. The reason, the reason for the cross is because of Christ's mission. Christ's mission was to defeat Satan, sin, and death. And so, from the time that Christ ascended and at Pentecost when the church was born, the church institutionally has been doing exorcisms throughout the entirety of the lifespan of the church. It wasn't until 1614 that the authorized ritual that most people have any sense of, largely because of Hollywood, was developed. And most likely, I would say, it was developed in order to standardize a pastoral practice that had been going on for centuries. Because in the early church, there, were, there was an order of exorcists. They weren't necessarily clergy. There was an order of exorcists because you have to remember in the letters of Paul, Paul let Paul's letters in Corinthians talk about gifts. And so the gifting goes on even today. And so to understand Satan, we have to begin with the cross. Otherwise, Satan is sort of this misplaced modifier who could easily be understood as a footnote to the re relationship between us and God that's formalized at our baptism in Christ and is, in a sense, affirmed in our confirmation and celebrated every time we come together for the celebration of the Eucharist. The origin of Satan is that not Satan was not a created being as Satan. The word Satan comes from the Hebrew Satan, which means adversary. But Satan was once Lucifer, God's greatest angel, known as the angel of light. So how did all this begin? 
it begins with the incarnation, which we oftentimes simply think of as Christmas. But at Christmas, at the incarnation, when Christ embraces, as the second person of the Blessed Trinity, when Christ embraces our human nature and retains his divine nature, it is then that the rebellion in heaven takes place. And the rebellion in heaven takes place because our human nature is lower than that of the nature of the angelic. And it meant that Satan and the angelic realm would have to worship and honor and give glory to the God-man. The notion of God lowering himself below that of the nature of angels was what caused the rebellion. It's Michael and those loyal to the Trinity that force Lucifer and a third of the angels, according to the book of Revelation, into the abode we call hell. Biblically speaking, what prompted the incarnation? Because that doesn't happen in a vacuum either. And it culminates with the crucifixion. If you look at the Bible, at the two bookends, the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation, in the book of Genesis, Satan isn't, the name, the term Satan is not even used. It's the serpent. It is, it is Lucifer who manifests himself as a serpent because he seduces Adam and Eve into believing that they can become like gods as well. And so when sin is introduced, it is then obviously, from what we know from Genesis, it is then that the human race falls out of that perfect relationship. It falls out of grace. And so the father, in order to try and help restore the human race, calls patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, to create the nation of God's chosen people and establishing the covenant of Abraham with God and Moses with God. And those covenants were broken over and over and over. And so the Father calls forth prophets, Ezekiel, Amos, Hosea, Jeremiah, and many others, whose mission it was, was to be the pronouncer of God's will and to help restore fidelity to the Mosaic Covenant. And their mission fails too. And so that's when the incarnation takes place. And so the one perfect sacrifice of Christ on the cross is what heals the estrangement between the human race and God caused by sin. Satan didn't want that to happen. And depending which synoptic gospel you read, you get a different version. So let me read to you, proclaim for you, the version of Matthew. This is the fourth chapter. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was hungry. The tempter approached and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become loaves of bread. Jesus said in reply, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and made him stand on the parapet of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and with their hands they will support you. 
lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Then the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their magnificence. And he said to him, All these I shall give you if you will prostrate yourself and worship me. At this Jesus said to him, Get away, Satan. It is written, The Lord your God shall you worship, and him alone shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. And so when Christ comes, he retains his divineness, he embraces our humanness in all of its fullness, in every aspect. And so as we just listened to, this is from the preface that leads into Jesus' public ministry. And so the devil wants, obviously, to do all he can to derail Christ, and he plays on his humanity. He attracts him with the notion of physical hunger. He attracts him with the sense of temporal power. He tries to tempt him in ways that are simply at his deepest part of his humanness. It is when Christ takes his last breath that his mission is fulfilled. And Satan knows that. And so in the scriptures, you have on the one hand, Genesis, where our first family are seduced into believing they could become like gods. And in the last book of the Bible, you have Satan manifesting self as a dragon preparing to devour the church. And between those two books, you have this cosmic battle going on to this present moment. That's very important for us to understand the context because then I can address you in a way where understanding that context, we all have a better understanding of, well, who is this Satan figure? In the church when I was a kid, up until the beginning of the, of the uh, up until 1966, 66, 67, when the first missile came out in English, in which mass was celebrated in English as it was celebrated in the vernacular in whatever particular country people lived in, for 85 years there was a prayer at the end of every mass. It was the the prayer to Saint Michael, and it was part of the Catholic culture. And so the mention of Satan, in which we pray that God would keep Satan away and defeat Satan in a sense of completely, that was part of our Catholic identity. It wasn't like we were obsessed with this, but it was part of our Catholic culture. When the new missile came out in 66, 67, I don't know the historical reason, the prayer was removed. And so over time, as that concept and that consciousness of Satan went away because it went out of our language, the ministry largely went to sleep. It wasn't until 2004 when, as I said earlier, when John Paul II issued this mandate that in a sense this ministry kind of like, it was like the gas got turned on again and people began to largely wake up. The ministry of exorcism is largely a ministry of healing because every person who approaches me, and this would be true of any exorcist in the, in the United States or in the world for that matter, every person who approaches us is coming with an issue involving some form, sometimes intense, some form of suffering. My role as the exorcist for my diocese, is to get to the root cause of the suffering, whether it is demonic or medical or psychological or psychiatric or something that's other. My role is to get to the root cause. And so a lot of what I do in this ministry, we would call discernment. 
What discernment is, is giving thoughtful consideration to options and possibilities that have a link between the behaviors, activities, and experiences of people and the movement of God and or, in this case, a preternatural being whom we call Satan from the Hebrew, Satan, which means adversary. People oftentimes think that somehow God created Satan. He didn't. He created Lucifer. Lucifer means angel of light. When Lucifer changed his role, his name changed. In the same way that Abram went from Abram to Abraham and Simon went to Peter, because their role changed, Satan is the Hebrew term meaning adversary. And so in this ministry, which is about healing, and I like to underline that, because most people, the concept people have of this notion of exorcism and all of its related parts, very oftentimes is largely dictated by Hollywood images. Now, I will be the first to tell you that very, very often what I experience, either in a deliverance session, which I'll explain the difference between deliverance and exorcism in a little bit, either in a deliverance session or in a formal exorcism, there is a lot of drama that you would see in Hollywood very, very often. And so most of the images and most of the circumstances that you would find in a Hollywood movie, most, not all, but most, are pretty accurate. None of this ministry is done in isolation. Now, I'm on the, we have a school for exorcism at Mundelein Seminary in Chicago. And I'm on the board of the school, and I was just teaching there uh, two months ago. And what I said to the 44 priests and six deacons who are now the newest candidates for this ministry, you cannot do this ministry uncollaboratively. It is intrinsically collaborative, which means by its very nature, you have to do this in concert with others for a whole lot of reasons. Number one, when you discern, it means that you're asking a variety of questions about the person's life. And you know, I always have to preface after we've done prayer, and very often my team, my prayer team, and I'll talk about them in a moment, my prayer team very oftentimes meets with people before I do. It just depends on how much is going on. We see a lot of people. Not everybody, more often than not, people have mental issues, I'm happy to report. But the church's ministry of healing also I think, encompasses if someone comes and believes they have a preternatural problem and they don't, pastorally speaking, it is highly inappropriate to say, okay, you don't have a preternatural problem, so goodbye. We don't deal with you. No. If we truly are functioning in the ministry of healing as Christ did and does, then we need to provide the resources to help the person, whether it's mental or some other issue. And so on my team, I have a, a physician who happens to be the physician for the San Francisco Giants and 49ers. I did not pick him for that reason. <laughs> I wish I could say for the Broncos, but maybe your exorcist has him from the Broncos. <laughs> I have a clinical psychologist, I have a psychiatrist, and then I have several professionals I'm glad you got your seats in the back. Friends of mine from a long time ago. I have those professionals and several who are bilingual because a lot of the people who come to us, their first language is not English. Their first language is Spanish or Vietnamese or another language. And if it is, we've got to go see if we can hunt and find someone professionally to help us with the discernment. Because even in the, in the uh, introduction of the solemn rite of exorcism, the church takes a very conservative position as it applies to when and how you minister to people who come with these requests. I get lots of phone calls and emails, and a lot of emails from all over the world, a lot of phone calls in the United States, and very often the phone call starts off with, Father, I need an exorcism. And my pat answer back to them is, I don't do them on demand. And then I say to them, I'm not being sarcastic. 
but that may not be what you need. So I have those professionals, then I have a prayer team, three married couples, and then several other people who are also part of the team, and they're with me, they're with me at every deliverance session and every solemn rite. Now the difference between a deliverance and an exorcism, they're both exorcisms, but a deliverance is not considered a solemn exorcism. A deliverance is called a minor exorcism which means that the prayers you pray are largely directed to God to expel either a presence that you come to find out about or to ask God if there is a presence to expel it. The solemn rite of exorcism is the authoritative rite of the church, as I said, that goes back to 1614 that has a specific prescription attached to it. And in that prescription... There are prayers that are addressed to God. There are also prayers that are directly addressed to the demon. The language that is used for the rite is Latin. It's also approved in Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese, and, and Polish. And it's also currently in being considered by the Vatican to be uh, approved in English. The translation has already been approved by the bishops of the US, but has not yet been approved by the Vatican. And so, all of those people are all part of the pieces of the puzzle when people come and they're asked very personal questions about their life. Tell me about what was it like growing up in your home. Tell me about your relationship with your parents. Tell me about your experience with your brothers and sisters, if you have brothers and sisters. Tell me about the experience of grade school, high school, college, your current life. What was the event that was the point of departure where you decided you needed to go and find an exorcist. Now, before I was a priest, if you saw the movie, in the movie, I'm portrayed in my prior life as a mortician. That is true about the movie. I was a mortician. I was a funeral director before I was a priest. So, the, who, goes to a, who goes to find a mortician unless you're a personal friend of theirs. You go to a funeral home because you have a need. It's the same thing with an exorcist. You don't go find an exorcist just to say, hi, who are you? Usually you go, unless you're a friend, usually you go because you have a need. So what was the event or experience that was the tipping point that led you to believe that seeking my assistance and the assistance of my team might help you with matters having to do with your own personal life. For in the discernment, which is much like when you go to a physician, your physician can't help you until, until you tell your physician, what are your, what, are your, what are your symptoms? So we're always listening. I know this is kind of a funny way to express this discernment. We're always listening for a doorway. So you ask the questions about your, your upbringing, your background. You, know, you ask questions about what are your personal habits? Do you have addictions? Drugs. I don't care if you smoke marijuana once, I want to know about it. Meth. Meth is a big doorway. Now, very oftentimes, meth users, as a side effect, will have chronic hallucinations. And I've had people who are meth users, former meth users, and they've been sober, but they've had chronic hallucinations because of the damage that meth does to the brain. I need to know that because the first meth person who came to me, I had to go find a toxicologist and say, what can you tell me about meth that I should know? I'm the exorcist of my diocese, whether you believe in any of that or not. What, what do I need to know about the attributes of meth that I should be aware of? That it takes at least three years for a person to have complete sobriety as to whether or not the brain will heal and there's no guarantee. That was very important information. Cocaine is a doorway. Hallucinogenic drugs are a doorway. Porn is a doorway. It's a big one. And I hear lots of confessions now where people come confessing that stronghold, and it is. Because not only of the effect it has on our brain, but it also serves as a doorway to the demonic because the demonic can also travel along electrical currents that does not mean that one's computer is possessed, but what it does mean, 
What it does mean is that those images can have a huge detrimental effect because of the effect on the brain. Violent video games. There's a Japanese violent video. So what do they do? They build a golden calf. That's a form of divination. This is becoming much more mainstream now in the US. And as it becomes more mainstreamed, it becomes kind of more part of the culture to go to a party. As I had a member of my parish come to me not too long ago and say, my daughter went to a birthday party and they played with a Ouija board. And I said, don't let your daughter go back to that house again. And I said, I will pray over your daughter just as a precaution. And it wasn't to scare her and nothing happened. But when these things become part of the culture, they look harmless. There has been a growing movement just as there was in Europe and it continues John Paul II mandated this because in Europe the occult was raging and is raging out of control. And as more people are drawn away from institutional religion or belief in a God in a personal way, or they're looking for alternatives because classical religion doesn't provide either the answers or the satisfaction or the fruitfulness or something else that's missing in their life, we are all spiritual beings. How can I say that? Because we all have a soul, regardless of whether we believe in God or not. We're all spiritual beings. And we have been given the ability to reason and the, form, the possibility of a formed conscience and the ability to have free will. And so because of that, that's what separates us from the lower elements of creation. And so therefore, when prayer doesn't work because I'm used to getting answers to questions and dilemmas because of the push of a button, which is as our society becomes more technologically advanced, we've also become more isolated because I can do everything and have everything I need without other relationships, including one with God. But people still are searching because there are questions in our life that will never become fully addressed while we live. And that is where science ends and spirituality and faith begins. And so as people search, the occult and the new age are all about power and knowledge. Unfortunately, if people's faith optic is thin, then they are not able necessarily to discern out what is a practice that is healthy and helpful and what are practices that I should stay away from. And very often when people seek me out, they are on, or another exorcist, they're on the precipice of recognizing that they have waded too far in to a reality in which they realize they're over their head. And so that's when they seek the assistance of an exorcist out. Or they've tried other approaches to see why are they having this severe depression? Why are they having psychosis types events of hearing things and seeing things? Why are they somehow under a kind of a state of oppression over a long period of time? Why are they having demonic dreams or violent dreams that psychiatrists and psychologists and medication attached doesn't seem to fix? And so very often I'm called because we've tried a lot of other approaches and I'm still suffering or my loved one is still suffering. Now, the question oftentimes I get asked is, well, how do you tell? Well, the discernment is the first step. And we listen very carefully for doorways. And then we usually will employ what we would say are called deliverance prayers. Prayers addressed to God in which we ask the Lord, A, if there is something, cast it out. And B, if there is something, please show it to us. I always believed in the power of prayer. But when you are in prayer, praying for illumination, you see how the power of prayer and the sacraments 
and the sacramentals have a tremendous power, not magic and not sorcery-like, but real power. For if there is a preternatural, in other words, a demon, or some other agent sent by Satan, the reaction to the prayer or to the sacramentals, the crucifix, holy water, and the sacraments, such as the Eucharist, will be palpable, viewable, and tremendous. And so that's the discernment. And so there's six classic signs that we look for as we're listening for the door, listening for the doorways. One, an aversion to the sacred. So if someone comes to church, a Catholic church or any church, someone goes into a sacred place in which it is a house of prayer, one of the, uh, the aversions might be one begins to get sick to their stomach, one feels nauseous, um, receiving the body of Christ in the Catholic tradition can be a harrowing experience because either the demon will give off an odor against the sacred species, the host, which will be so pungent that the person cannot receive. Or if they do receive, consuming the Eucharist will burn as they're swallowing it. Or if they bless themselves with holy water. Or even if during the consecration of the Mass, they will begin to have a reaction. That's one possibility. Secondly would be during a deliverance session, we never start out with a formal exorcism. That's the last thing an exorcist ever does, always. I'll tell you why in a little bit. Another would be during a prayer session, the person begins to possess a kind of physical strength that they don't normally possess. I'll give you one, one well, I'll give you two examples. One was in Italy, one was at home. And I was with Father Carmen, and I knew nothing. I mean, I believed in the existence of Satan. And I began to go to his sessions, Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursday afternoons, from 3.30 to 6.30. I did that for three and a half months. And we saw lots of people. And this one day, he spoke very little. I knew more Italian than he knew English. So he says to me, Padre Gary, come on Saturday. A very interesting case. So I show up. And these two priests, these two Franciscans, one of whom I knew, bring in this woman who was about four feet, nine inches tall. And they're having a hard time bringing her in. And they sit her in the chair, and she is just growling, and she is sticking her tongue out and spitting at the priest, and she is screaming and yelling. And when he started the prayer, when he started the formal rite, it ended up having five of us holding this woman down. Otherwise, the demon through the woman would have probably tried to kill the priest. And this is a four foot nine woman, four foot nine inch woman. At home, I worked with a man who, when he was in his mother's womb, his father did not believe that the child in his wife's womb was his. The family was from El Salvador. And so he began, out of a sense of jealousy and mistrust, performing acts of witchcraft against his wife while she was carrying the baby. Bad. The wife, in turn, in retaliation, started performing acts of witchcraft against her husband. They're divorced now. <laughs> when Victor was two, he was molested by a half-brother. For years, he believed that he had a guardian angel around him because he felt there was something attached. Eight years ago, he's 43 now, eight years ago, in a cathedral, I won't mention the diocese because I want to protect his anonymity, he manifested at the Easter vigil for the very first time in front of the bishop. And so they ended up calling me because they had no exorcist in that diocese and they went to a priest who's also in my priest support group in that diocese and we worked with him for four years and these were the most ferocious demons I have ever seen in my life as far as just getting him in the church sometimes it would take a half an hour because the demons within him were trying to restrain him from coming in and so 
when during the rite of exorcism, we would have four or five, six people around him and restraining him appropriately if necessary. We finally got to the point of calling on Michael and the archangels to restrain him, and they do. Because you have to be careful. You don't want to do some harm or damage to the person over whom you are praying. So that's another example. Another example would be beginning to speaking in a language you have no competency in. So during prayer, the person just begins speaking in Spanish or Russian or Latin or gibberish or some kind of language that has cadences to it, but you don't know what it is. But it's not just babble. Another sign would be during prayers, the person begins to tell things about you or somebody else with you. That's why I always, we always make sure we go to confession before a deliverance or an exorcism or we've been recently. Another would be um, what's called foaming at the mouth, where during prayer, the person begins to cough in a way in which they're trying to expel something as opposed to, I just don't feel very good. But it goes on for a, a long period of time. And usually what, it, what, you're, what the person is convulsing, they're convulsing the demon. And it comes out in the form of sputum. And that's what foaming at the mouth is. That's actually a good thing. Because demons are pure spirits. They don't have bodies, like corporeal bodies like we do. They're more powerful than we are. They travel faster than we are. And their sense of free, free will is far clearer and keener than ours is. The last sign is a distortion that would look something like a person who has epileptic seizures where the face is distorted, the limbs, the arms and the legs are, are flying around. Sometimes the person will... will put themselves into a position, some kind of a body language position that looks similar to what a, a snake would look like on Animal Planet rolled up. And I've seen that often. And then it's hissing and it's blaspheming and it's calling you names and cursing and all of that stuff. So those are the classic signs. You don't have to have all six signs for us to be convinced that the person needs deliverance prayer and maybe eventually needs an exorcism. But you always want to move up the chain of command. So for a Catholic, you get the person back into a rhythm, if, unless they're in a rhythm, you get them into a rhythm of prayer daily, mass weekly, Eucharist weekly, confession monthly. Just as a little commercial. I think there's, there's a direct correlation between why is there more satanic activity on the rise in this country and in Western civilization and the disuse or lack of use of the sacrament of reconciliation. Reconciliation is more powerful than an exorcism. I'm not suggesting people need to go to confession every week. But when we go and receive the sacrament of reconciliation, as with all the seven sacraments, there's grace. There is, there is a kind of relationship with God that's deepened that is, in a sense, a benefit from receiving that authoritative spiritual experience. The sacraments are, the canonical number is seven, as you know. There's lots of events that happen in the church, but those seven have a unique place in our spiritual life. And the more that we stay in the rhythm of conversion, the more, I believe, mindful we are of how do we stay in the realm of the grace of God. I am not at all suggesting that the people who come to me are, are bad people. Most of the time, I'd say the vast majority of the time, the person who comes to me are people who have, where well, there is something demonic, who waded into the pool looking for answers because prayer didn't work for them or some other aspect of their Catholic life didn't work for them or someone suggested it and they're doing it simply out of curiosity. They're not doing it because they hate God. They're look doing it because most of the time they're curious and they're searching. There are times when people have rejected God and gone in the path that I've just described and then realize they went in the pool too deep. And so when they come and we ask these questions and we see the results, the power of prayer and the power of God in Christ is what frees them. Even my talk here is very appropriate given that this is the year of mercy because Christ 
performed lots of exorcisms. He did lots of healings. He largely had two roles in his job description. He taught and he healed. And some of those healing miracles were exorcisms. Now, when I was in seminary 32, 35 years ago, we, were, we, we, rare, we rarely, I don't think we ever talked about any of this with any depth. I don't even think we'd mentioned Satan more than a few times in all my four years. And we're trying to change that now in the whole seminary formation program. Not so that every priest is a trained exorcist, but that every priest ordained at least ought to know what to do and have a basic understanding of the language of this ministry. Because not only is it becoming more relevant, but it's also if you don't know what you're doing or at least know the right questions to ask, you can do more harm than good. So how do you protect yourself? Because when you walk out of here tonight, I don't want you walking out here going, oh my God, I have to really, <laughs> what's going to happen next? Christ 60 times in the Gospels says, do not be afraid, 60 times. He says, resist the devil. He doesn't say, be afraid of the devil. There are four ordinary means of protection for Catholics. A faith life, a prayer life, a sacramental life, and a moral life. And for people who are not Catholic but Christian, a faith life, a moral life, and a prayer life. And for people who are not Christian, pardon me, not Christian at all, they might be Catholic, they might be Christian but not Catholic, but for non-Christians, I think if you live a life that is in the spirit of the will of God, we call that baptism by desire, and you live a moral life, you not only know right from wrong, but you choose right over wrong, and you have a formed conscience, and your mission in, li in life is to do the very best you can with what you've been given, those are our protections. A faith life, for Catholics and Christians at least, and people who are searchers. I have a relationship with God, some kind. Now, I'm not here to judge what that is, but I, I'm, I have a relationship with God, and hopefully a personal one, but at least I'm searching, and a prayer life, which means I'm in communication with God. I talk with him. It doesn't mean I have to read something out of a book per se. It might be I reflect on the scriptures. It might be I take five minutes a day, which is what I tell our kids every day, take five minutes, whether it's when you get up in the morning, whether you go to bed at night, whether it's in the bathroom or in the car or someplace, take five minutes and just be quiet with God and talk to him and then listen. So you have to, just like those of you who are married or those of you who aren't married but you have friends or you have a fiancé or a girlfriend, the people who are we're closest to, we've hopefully spent some time with. The same thing is true about our relationship with God. We have to spend time with God. And out of spending time with God, we then are prompted to ask, well, what, why am I here? What am I doing here? And what happens to me when I die? I cite those every time I celebrate a funeral mass because in our human DNA, we are all creatures of origin because every created thing has a beginning except God. So we ask those questions. Why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? In the old Baltimore Catechism, which I think Mary still applies, why did God make me? To know, love, and serve him in order to live with him forever in heaven. So the more we have a relationship with God, the more we want to be in relationship with God. And the more we want to be in relationship with God, we want to, in a sense, live as God would hopefully want us to and know what's right from wrong and live it that way. And then the sacraments are like our vitamin shots. I take about seven vitamins a day. Those are our vitamins. That's what helps us give, have an armor to protect ourselves against the evil one. So those you do those things and you stay in that rhythm, Satan can't hurt you. It's when we get away from that and we drift away and we seek other means to find purpose and meaning in life where we get in trouble. Satan isn't waiting for us per se, but it's those who, in a sense, wave a flag or blow a whistle and dabble in the stuff I mentioned before that all of a sudden the spirit world pays attention and says, hey, this guy is looking for a relationship because that's what a possession is all about. A possession is all about a relationship. 
very few people are fully possessed. But the ones that have a demonic problem very oftentimes could be even sitting in this audience. And you have a job, you have a family, you raise your kids, you drive your car, you go places, you do things. But there are certain things that we don't see, that your family may not see, but they may notice, but they're not sure what to do about it, and you might not be either. But there could be something demonically attached if you traipsed around and gone waded too deep in the pool. And so in our life, what we're called to be are disciples, be followers of Jesus. And the protection is there to help us see our way clearly to the end of our life. And at the end of our life, we have a face-to-face -face encounter with Christ. Now, I don't know what he says. I haven't been there yet. But John of the Cross said once in the 14th century, the question is, that he thinks God, Christ asks, is how well did you love me? Which makes a lot of sense because God's really much more simple than we make him out to be. How well did you love me? And then either God assigns us or we assign ourselves, either to hell, purgatory, or heaven. Purgatory isn't bad. It's the beginning of paradise. But we're not always necessarily wearing the right clothes when we get there to have that face-to-face -face conversation. And so therefore, the ministry of exorcism is all about mercy. And God, the Father, sends the Son out of his mercy. And God was willing to lower himself below that of the nature of angels in order for us to have the bridge that would get us to heaven. The demonic realm, once was part of the angelic realm, still re maintains, retains its nature. But those who were jealous and prideful, that's what got in their way. They are not savable because their free will is so much clearer than ours that in the scriptures it's very clear that their choice was so, was so clear to reject God that it's galvanized. And so at the end of time, when Christ returns, they will be destroyed. In the meanwhile, a cosmic battle goes on. Why does God permit Satan to exist so that with boundaries? So that we have a clear choice. Do we want to follow the light? Do we want to follow the darkness? Christ and his life and his mission and the cross, though it looks like a symbol of death, it is a symbol of life. It is a pathway to heaven and to the heavenly realm where we're all joined together again with our, with our purpose fulfilled to live with God in heaven, which is where we came from. The alternative is pure destruction and pure desolation. There are some who've chosen that already, but God gives us every opportunity to turn our life around and to walk with him into paradise. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father Gary Thomas. We're about to start a question and answer session. The mics are up here. We ask that your questions remain as concise and brief as possible for the respective time. Um, also, if you take time to fill these out, just pass the raffle tickets as far away from the center as possible. Um, thank you so much. Uh, this mic, yeah, there it's working. Father Thomas, I have a question for you. Um, you know, people talk about they have ghosts in their house or the loved one that has passed on has come back, and, and that's who they believe it is. But I always felt that when you die, your spirit moves on. It doesn't stick around your, this environment. So are, are ghosts actual loved ones that have passed on, or are they demonic spirits? That's a very good question, and I, I can give you an answer based on personal experience. I've exercised the homes of many people in my 10 years as exorcist. Very, very often when people will call about their home, they'll say, I've seen a trans, although I've seen a spirit or I've seen a shadow or I've seen a person 
walking around my house or walking down the hall or appearing in places. Um, and the question that I usually will, a will ask a few questions, then I usually will go out and just exercise the house. Do you recognize if it is a transparency where it's very clear it's a human being, do you recognize who it is? Has this person talked to you? Do you talk to it? And tell me a little about the history of your home. Very, very often, when a person dies in a house, especially if they've died as a result of a homicide or a suicide, not always, but often, they can get stuck because they're not able to move forward. Um, or they may have in their life, they may have committed some kind of crime, whether it was ever um, prosecuted or not, and at the time of their death, very often they can't move on. Now, occasionally, what the house is infested with is something demonic. And I'll ask the same kinds of questions. And most of the time, people don't know. But occasionally, if anybody has done any kind of ritual involving Satan or um, the New Age or the occult in their home, it's not impossible for a conjuring of something preternatural to show up. It's just, that's why I ask. Tell me about the history of the house. Some people know, most people don't. When it appears to be a human spirit, it's usually because the person has not been able to move on for a reason. Now, in my work as an exorcist, and this is a little bit of a stretch, but it's, this has been true, and I've talked to other exorcists about this. Sometimes where there is a, a tribe of demons, there's never just one demon. If there's, a de if there's a demonic problem with a person, there's never one. They're a tribe. There's usually one that Satan assigns, very powerful demon. And then he will recruit, that demon will recruit a whole group. It could be a dozen, it could be hundreds, it could be thousands. They will tell you because you ask them, because I have the authority to do so. So in the case sometimes of deliverance, what will show up first is not a demon, but a disembodied human being. And usually, and then I end up having a conversation with them. You don't deal, you don't converse with the demons. You ask them three questions. What is your name? When are you leaving? And how did you get in? Those are the three questions. Other than that, you don't talk to them. Because they don't tell you the truth anyway. And you command them to tell you the absolute truth. And they have to, they're legalists. So they have to play by the rules. And I tell them that all the time. So in the case of a disembodied spirit, very often they're attached to, they haven't gone for judgment. The same thing is true if it's a house. Usually something is, they're stuck. I'll give you a very good example that happened a month ago. I had a Muslim family call me and the, in the house was the mother and the two kids, both grown up, and the one younger daughter had a boyfriend living in the house, just not cohabitation, just living in a room. So he emails me, I guess he went on Google or whatever and found me. He emails me and tells me they have this problem in the house. So I called him and I asked a few questions and I went out to the house and the young daughter, the youngest daughter, she's probably mid to late 20s and the boyfriend were there. It was a couple of, it was the day after Easter. So I said, well tell me what's going, tell me about what you see and how long this has been going on. She said, I see a woman who's dressed in white with gray hair, and she just appears in the living room, and she sits there. And I don't, she doesn't talk to me, I don't talk to her, she appears, and she'll just stay. But she says, that's the same woman we had in our previous house. And she says, but what's happened now is there is a transparency of a man. But he doesn't, he's, I said, well, how tall is he? He's a normal, he's not particularly tall, but he's, he appears to be a man. It's a shadow. You can see everything but the face. So I said, well, tell me about what happened in your prior house. Well, the mother and the father divorced over physical and sexual abuse, and sexual abuse done against the two daughters. 
and they have never had, the daughters have never had any real relationship with the father from the time when they were abused and the divorce took place. And so he died. And after he died, all of these manifestations began happening in the house. So I said, okay, it's possible that it could be your dad and maybe your dad met another spirit along the way, not impossible, and maybe somehow your dad is attached to you because the new house they moved into, which had been like six months, same problems. So I said, it's not the house, it's you and your family. That's where the attachment is. So I exercised the whole house and I went around, you go around the entire house, there's a ritual for a home or a thing, different from exorcism of a person. I did all of that, and then I severed the ties between the daughter, and I said, I want your mother's name, your sister's name, and anybody else in your immediate family, and I'm going to sever the tie between you, all the ungodly and holy ties between you and your father, your sister and your father, your mother and your father, etc. And then I asked her a number of other questions, and I severed all of those ties. Now, you do that because when you sever the ties, it releases... In the spirit world, if somehow there is a right to an ownership of a thing or a person, you have to sever the tie in order to break that ownership. And so I, we spent about an hour there. So I, I says, you know, if you need to call me, I'm going to be on retreat. Here's my cell. So the next day I get a phone call. You really ticked those spirits off. Okay. So I offered Mass on retreat, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then I went home to the parish and Saturday, and the following Monday, I offered Mass six days in a row for the Father. After the first day, all of the manifestations stopped, and the mother and the sister came to see me last week to thank me. So either he was stuck there out of guilt or he was stuck there out of anger and rage. And either way, it didn't matter. So I severed the tie between the father and the tie of guilt and the father and the tie of rage. And then in the masses I offered at the retreat house with the nuns and the others on retreat, I specifically offered the mass for the intention of this man by name. And any ties that are keeping him, that, are, that have a stronghold, and then I, I use the cross, which I use often. I'll say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I sever with the sword of the cross the tie between. In this case, I use the cross. And I do this in confession a lot, too. When someone comes in and they have a kind of stronghold, a kind of sin that they just can't get rid of, it's usually an addiction or it's the sin of unforgiveness or rage or anger or pornography or another addiction, I will use the cross and say, I use the cross to crush the stronghold of and take the debris of the stronghold and bind it to the cross of Christ. But when I prayed, those six, offered those six masses, they said, after the first day, we had no more problems. So very, very often, those are real deals. And usually the, the, the soul is stuck. There's something that's preventing the person from being able to go to the other side. And hopefully, even though he's a Muslim, he was able to go to Christ and be judged. And hopefully the mercy of God will help him. Go ahead. Please, I'm sorry. Um, Father, are we ever allowed? OK. I've been in some programs where they've taught us how to um, do rebuking prayers or how to rebuke Satan directly. And recently I watched a show on EWTN where they've done a study, or they had a conference, and they said, we really aren't supposed to, as lay people, directly rebuke Satan. Is that so? What, what's your, what is that? I mean, and who's allowed to do, do like, a deliverance prayers? Okay, let me answer the first question first <laughs> and the second question second. Um, <laughs> I don't, th I see no reason why you cannot pray as, a, I think because of our baptism, we have the license, we have a license to say, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I command you, leave my house, or leave me alone, or leave my grandchild alone, or what, you have the right, you have the legal, you have the, you have the legal spiritual license to say that. So I don't see any reason why you cannot say, 
In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I rebuke Satan, or I rebuke, reject, and renounce something that, it, that may be coming against you or someone whom you love. I don't see any reason why you can't do that. As far as deliverance prayers go, I would be cautious only insofar as, A, you don't want to do them by yourself. B, I think you should seek out a prayer team or a prayer group that has had some experience with doing this. And then I think you, ideally you should be under the authority of a priest who's got some knowledge of this. But lay people, and I've told the priests in our diocese and other dioceses, priests can pray prayers of deliverance, but you do need to know what you're doing. I don't think I would address Satan in a direct way, but you can say in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I, Satan, leave me alone. I think that's appropriate. But I think if you're going to go and you're going to pray over somebody who may have some kind of preternatural condition or other kind of oppressive, oppressive condition, I would do that with supervision. Well, this new committee says they, that's apparently going to train the parish priests to, you know, in this, in this area, said we should not, because when we rebuke them directly, that we're, we're going into battle with Satan, and it's sufficient just to say, God, would you rebuke the evil one for me? Okay. So I just was wondering okay. where that's going. Well, I think, as I said, I don't think there's anything wrong with you doing that in a direct way as a person about yourself. Right. But if you were to do that over someone else, I would do that directly in concert with the authority of a priest and a team. Okay, thank you, Father. I hope that helps. Sure, please, hi. Hello, is this working? It is, but you're gonna have to really speak almost like you're swallowing it. Okay. But don't okay. swallow it, please. So my question is somewhat two parts. Okay. So first part, if you know somebody who you believe to be under demon, demonic attack, oppression, possession, infestation, what have you, A, who do you call? And B, while you're waiting for someone to arrive, what do you do? Well, when you say you're waiting for someone to arrive, are, are you like expecting this, like an EMT to show up within five minutes? <laughs> no. Well, okay. What do you do in the meanwhile? Yeah, okay. what do you do in the meanwhile if, if you've contacted the right if you have, If you know someone whom you believe ha has this condition, A, do they want to be helped? They have to want to be helped. If they do not want the help of the church, then honestly, no amount of prayer, if they're dragged, kicking and screaming to the priest exorcist or the priest who maybe has gifts of deliverance or whatever, no amount of prayer is going, to, is going to relieve the person because God doesn't interfere in free will. If they want help and you believe that this person has the condition you're describing, I would contact the vicar general of your local diocese and ask your vicar general, how, what is the protocol I need to follow? Or go to your local priest and ask your priest, what is the, lo what is the protocol I need to follow in helping my friend get some help? That's what I would do. And in the meanwhile, if your friend isn't, is, if your friend is a Catholic and they're not churchgoers, get them back as best you can into a rhythm of prayer and the sacraments. That's, that's the first step. And I think you always, in, in, the, in sort of the protocol, the last, as I said before, the last thing an exorcist does, if there is something preternatural going on, is a formal exorcism. If I can use deliverance prayer and free the person completely, I will do that. Sometimes, out of not so much convenience, but out of, you want to do the deliverance prayer for a period of time. After such time, if you think an exorcism will actually work more efficiently, you can do that. But it's only after you've really kind of gone up the protocol. So I'd say either talk to your local priest, or you could call the local vicar general of your diocese. And they'll put, hopefully they'll put you in touch with the exorcist. Okay, and you said that the person has to want to be helped. Yes. What if they're a relative of yours and they do not want to be helped, but you cannot, you are tied to them and you know they're in a demonic place? Unless they want to be helped, the, the rule of thumb is, and I mean, I've had, I've said to folks, if they do not want to be helped, God isn't going to interfere in free will. Okay. I hope that's helpful. Yes, please. Hi. You Why do pull, demon pull this, pull it down. No, 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 just pull the mic down. 
Why do demons choose to possess people? Demons choose to possess people for two reasons. One, demons are parasites. And from the time that they rejected God, they are gradually dying. And so we provide a kind of artificial life for them that they otherwise do not have. Secondly, because they have one goal. They already know they've been defeated. They've been defeated from the moment that Christ died on the cross. Their goal is to take as many of us to hell and condemnation with them as possible. So the possession is twofold. A, because it gives them life, and two, because they want to isolate us away from the opportunities for salvation that are ours. But by isolating us away and drawing us into a deeper, dark reality with them, they want us basically to be condemned with them. Thank you. Okay. I know this, uh, that there's a lot of hurts in our society. You want to speak closer to the microphone, please? I know this, that there's a lot of hurt in our society. Um, what can we be doing as lay people to try to encourage uh, people to get help? Well, I think what you can do, first of all, you can pray for them, and then you can say to them that each diocese should have a kind of protocol whereby when these kinds of situations arise, there's hopefully a response available to them. A lot of the people who email me from around the United States are usually people who don't know that there's a protocol or they've contacted their diocese and sometimes they've hit a brick wall and they don't know where to go. So sometimes what we will do is we'll put them in touch if there is an exorcist in that diocese, we'll put them in touch via email with that exorcist and if there's one, if there isn't one, We'll put, one, put them in touch with somebody who's relatively close by. Okay, so that's the, the question I had. But, um, I, Could you speak closer to the microphone? I've uh, noticed a, lo a lot um, going on around. I have also have traveled in different parts of the country, and there are some areas where I've noticed a lot more activity than others. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I think each bishop and each local church have to deal with it as they see fit. Okay. Thank you. We have time for one more question, and then Father Gary Thomas will be available afterwards. Hi. Hello, Father. Good evening um, to you. Good evening. I don't have a lot of personal experience with this, but I've heard of mediums before, people who talk to spirits or... So they seem. Um, so I wondered if you consider mediums to be a doorway to demons or um, evil spirits, or if they're an appropriate interaction with souls that are still on earth. My problem with mediums is that you don't know where the medium has gotten their power. Now, there are people who are gifted. In other words, they can read minds. They, can, they have a sense of the future. They might even be able to see spirits of dead people and demons. There are people who have that ability. My problem with the mediums is, A, where did they get their power, and B, who are they in touch with? Because it's a form of divination. There is a lot of, I've had people call me, who have, and I've had people come and see me who've been to mediums, and what that has done to them, that has opened them up whereby the tie between them and the medium created the possibility of something demonic. And so that's why I always say you need, you need to stay away. You need to stay away from that because you're using an artificial means to go around God. Um, I'm not suggesting that mediums are people doing things in bad faith. Sometimes mediums are frauds, and they do this for money. Exorcists don't do this. for We don't, do, we don't take a dime for any of this. Sometimes if they're not... Sometimes there are gifted people. Sometimes, you know, they are very sincere. But I tell folks, I, I would not do, go there. You're, you're tying yourself to someone who may have, a, the person may have gotten their power from a demon themselves. So that's why I say I, I, it's a form of divination, and that's why I tell people to avoid that. Okay.
be before you, was this helpful? Was this okay? Okay. okay. If you, when you walk out of here tonight, I just want to say one more thing when I've said it already. Do not be afraid. Christ has won. The battles go on. The war has been won. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be vigilant against evil in all of its forms. There's a condition of evil. There are events that are evil. But there is also, in our belief system, there is personified evil. And it's been brought down through the ages all the way from the time of Scripture. So this is not medieval. This is not mythological. And this is not, you know, symbolic. Satan is real. But if you stay in the realm of what I, discussed, what I presented already, you have nothing to fear. Resist the devil. Live a life, all of us together, in solidarity. Always staying in the grace of God and always having our sights on heaven.